Hello, everybody. Uh, Nick Rains here. We're still waiting for Robin to join us. Robin, do you want to turn on your uh, your video? And you're there. He is. Hi. There he is. All right. Excellent. So, welcome everybody to another one of our Leica Academy webinars. I'm Nick Rains, uh, as you probably know by now. Um, today, we've got Robin Lowe with us, who's going to be sharing uh, with us his uh, images um, from his career as a commercial photographer and some of his personal images too. So, I encourage you to uh, ask a few questions on the Q and A, not the chat, the Q and A, and then I can see those questions and and put them to Robin, hopefully at appropriate moments without interrupting too much. I've also got a couple of questions that have been emailed in from some people before so thank you for that we'll come to those when there's a uh, an image which uh, is relevant to the question so Robin welcome to our number eight webinar how are you today good thanks pleasure to be here Good, good. Yes. So um, we just we generally um, go through the images. Uh, I know we've spoken about this, but we'll be going through some of your images in a sec. And mm -hmm. uh, I'll just encourage you just to just to talk to those images. But f first of all, could you just maybe give us a, a, a bit of a, a summary about who you are, where you've come from in your career and, and, and just a little bit about yourself, just to introduce yourself to our viewers? Sure. Well, um, got my first camera when I was about eight. Um, a Diana plastic with a plastic uh, or plastic on lens which was pretty pretty marvelous back then so I thought that was a, a really good thing to have and um, never got to put a lot of film through it because it was you know like film was expensive at the time so um, but then um, as a teenager young teenager like a lot of um, young teenagers I um, happened to see um, Michael, Michelangelo Antonioni's um, blow up and I thought, I want to be a photographer. <laughs> so that's what I decided. That's what I wanted to be. So David Bailey, um, that was a, a um, apparently is based on David Bailey, who everyone probably knows is a great photographer and, uh, and admired his work ever since. So, And then um, during um, secondary school, I was uh, very fortunate to be able to be um, take photography as a subject mm. with the late Carol Jerrams, who... Um, was an amazing photographer who's uh, passed quite young, but um, left it left quite a mark. Um, I think she was the first uh, photographer to actually be uh, exhibited at um, National Gallery of Victoria. It was around that time where um, photography was still not it was it was questioned if it was an art form, mm. and it was quite a big thing for her to. Um, it was an amazing thing that they actually um, exhibited her work. Her work still exhibited a lot at Heidi Gallery in Melbourne and Monash that come up from time to time. So if anyone ever um, gets the chance to see um, her body of work, it'd be worth doing. So she, she was a real um, inspiration to me, mm. and um, which was amazing. And then after finishing VCE or Year 12, I um, was lucky enough to get an apprenticeship at a studio in Collingwood, Allen Studios, which was the oldest at the time. In Australia, and we had a mix of mix of clients. So it was um, being back in the day with um, photography it used to be, you know, like just photographers did everything. So, and a lot of our a lot of our clients were going back for over a hundred years. So we used to do all the work for um, the VFL, which was or the AFL now, um, and um, Melbourne Cricket Ground. So there's a lot of lot of portraits there, a lot of groups. Um, there's a lot of um, premiership photographs taken by that studio. So, plus a lot of commercial clients, architectural clients, which have been around for a long, long time. So, um, got to vary quite a bit portraiture. So that that gave me the grounding as well as um, learning uh, processing. I was really thrown into deep in there because there's no time for sort of um, just learn on the on the go. So it was long hours um, learning processing color, printing color, E6. Um, learning how to get black and white prints out really quickly and processing black and white negatives. So that was quite that was quite um, a, a bonus being able to sort of learn the whole gamut of photography. Mm. And then um, after spending many years there, I actually got into publishing and had a publishing career for a while there, sort of started publishing um, bridal magazines, mm. so, which was um, um, fun. I really enjoyed that. And... Um, had um, this sort of sort of thing we used to publish, this sort of like Couture, which was a Couture sort of magazine, which is a um, quite a, quite a lovely, uh, quite quite. Um, also did um, wedding um, photographers collections, which we did as well, which is all based on wedding photographers, which is just one of them there. Um, 
that was um, photographed as by the late commercial photographer who was brilliant photographer, Eric, from Tommy and Eric. He was a great photographer. And this one here was another one we did, which was um, from our other was a photography collection, which was great. It was that, that was um, Bronwyn Kidd, who was a, who's a remarkable photographer as well, commercial advertising. So, um, yeah, so that, that was sort of that. And then after 12 years, um, the magazines were acquired by your publisher, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, the one that published your, your stuff. And then I got back into photography, working um, in um, just back into commercial work and doing as, as evidenced now. by the background behind you. <laughs> yeah, which is which is what we yeah. So um, which which is what we do. Um, which I mean, I mean, most of my work's recommendation. So well, pretty all of it's recommendation. I do a cross section of work, mm -hmm. um, and that that's something where I've had over the years been able to um, uh, really just acquire knowledge as I go, you know, as I move along through different aspects of photography. So, yeah, mm, mm. that's pretty much it. Mm. What, one question um, came to mind when you were talking was that when you started in photography, it sounds to me like photography was more of a job than a calling. Is that fair to say? Or was it something that you just absolutely had to do and you couldn't wait to get started? I, 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 I did it as a, I, I did it as I just couldn't wait to get started. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. I want to be a photographer. Originally, I want to be a photographer like Carol Jerrams and do work mm -hmm. like her do. Um, you know, sort of what she was doing, but um, I, I didn't see that there would be a, a good future for me in that. So I thought I have to go into commercial right. and work commercially. Yeah. And then I was going to go to Pran, the Pran Institute, which is a photography college there um, in Melbourne's gone now. But that's where um, Carol had gone, and um, a lot of other photographers, Rennie Alice as well, um, who was a good friend of hers. I met through. I met him through her as well. And then um, so, and I was fortunate enough to get this job as an apprenticeship and then just got thrown in the deep end. So that, that sort of put it, uh, I was lucky enough. What I've noticed um, with the interviews I've been doing like this is that I think without exception, everybody wanted to become a photographer and they've taken whatever steps necessary to get to that mm. point. And it sounds like you're no exception. Maybe it's the case that you have to love doing it because nobody else would be daft enough to work all the long hours and deal with all the uncertainties that we have to in this industry. Yeah, Nick, that's so true. I, I mean, I've, I've, um, that's, that's all I do. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a blessing that you can actually do mm. um, your job and it's, your, your career mm. and it's your hobby, which is wonderful. That's... So I just love taking photographs. So that's the thing I just, I don't mind. I, I'll take you know, anything pretty much. Um, as long as I'm taking well, photographs, I'm happy. Camera in hand. <laughs> The uh, the work that we've got to show makes that uh, abundantly clear because the, the the breadth of work in these twenty images is is quite astonishing. So that's probably a good a good point to start. So I'm mm -hmm. going to share my uh, my screen here and bring up Robin's. Should be able to see that. That should be sharing. And this this is the first image that you put in there. You put them in a very specific order. So I'm I'm just going to let you talk through these images and, and let me know what it is. Uh, about this image and the other images that, that made you choose them for this presentation? Yeah, well, I, I sort of started on some images that were sort of going back a bit and photographed on film. And um, I, uh, I thought just a good way to start. Why not start with um, some film work? Um, that was taken with um, an X-Pan 45mm lens mm -hmm. and um, on AGFA RS1000 transparency film which I loved. I love that film so, a lot. It's um, something that, um, that uh, it's just, you just can't get that sort of look on any other film, I don't think. It's yeah. just sort of, it's got its own feel. To, it, to me, it was like shooting Polaroid. Mm. Just had that Polaroid feel to it but with grain, but with grain. So mm. it's, um, mm. it's, it's a very, very nice film. For, so I thought, those people, why not sorry. start with that? I was interrupting. Sorry, I thought, um, just for those people watching, I'm I'm looking at Robin's images in front of me here. So uh, if, if I'm dipping my eyes, it's not because I'm looking away. It's because I'm actually having a good close look at the images. So so this this is um, an X pan shot, but it's not the same vertical proportions as the X pan because that was quite a panoramic camera, wasn't it? No, you could do either panoramic or just straight 35 mm. Oh, okay. So you just with a flick of a button. So I think of button, you could either do, I mainly used it for panoramic, but um, it was, quite, it was, it was um, a delight to use as a, um, as a normal 35 mil as well. Yeah. I, I just learned Much something. Panoramic. I actually didn't know that. So I've never used an X-Pan. I always associate it with that 2.4 to 1 proportion or whatever it was like this. But mm -hmm. uh, there you go. I just learned something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That same, that same morning I shot most of them on um, panoramic, but uh, 
it, it's it's um it's it's a great it was a great camera in its day. It was sort of mm. like a quite a, quite ahead of its time. Absolutely, I know that there was mm. a lot of calling for a panoramic uh, digital camera for many many years. Like people were saying, can we have a uh, an expand panoramic, please? But I I don't I never thought that was a very good idea because you can always crop an image anyway and as long as you've got enough resolution to do that successfully it probably doesn't matter that the sensor is not a panoramic shape but I think people like to be forced into the, the shape and think in terms of that shape and, and it, it changes the way you look at the scene doesn't it? Mm, I, there was talk of it there was, on and off for a while there going mm, back mm, there was talk mm, about mm, it but, there was. but I, I was the same I thought I couldn't really see the, the need for it um, mm. yeah yeah okay. it's not something all righty. Whoops. Let's mm. got to click the right button here. There we go. Now, this, this is, tell us about this one. I think this is astonishing. This was a cover of one of the magazines I, I um, was publishing. Um, and um, I've actually got the cover. I've got the actual cover here. So I can actually, if you can um, oh, wow. there we are. put it there. So that's a the cover there. Um, it's, um, it was taken on, on um, my um, R4S with the 90 mil. Um, um, F2 lens, which is a beautiful lens. Still, still got all my R lenses today. Still use them occasionally, and um, and again that was shot on the Agfa RS1000, and then converted to black and white. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's just give it, it's just got that really beautiful um, sort of feel about it. It's just a, just a you know between I used to think with my my. R four and um and and the lenses and the um and the egg for film was just um was always stunning results. Yeah, when when you showed me this image yesterday, um, I asked you if you'd, it was shot on large format film because it, mm. it has that. I don't know. It's really hard to put your your finger on what what it what it looks the, the look of it, but it's got mm. that very distinct very distinct fall off. It's not just a depth of field thing, is it? There's something no. else about that. I mean, this to mm. me seems to have captured that look um, unbelievably well. And so, and when you told me it was on the R4S, I thought, well, that that does make sense. So, Leica have had that look going way, 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 way back, way and back, way back. Yeah. And that leads me very neatly to um, a question from mm -hmm. which was it? Right? There we go, Gavin Green. This is a nice question. I like this one, mm -hmm. Desert Island M lens. If you were stuck on a desert island, which M lens would you take with you? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> well, I, I used to love the um, which I had, which was a Noctilux uh, mm -hmm. fifty mil, mm -hmm. and I actually, um, and it was a dream. It was a dreamy lens, but we ended up um, um, buying a. Um, Apo Summicron F2, and that's kind of my lens of choice now. It's just a beautiful lens. I just love that for yeah. and get more yeah. use out of it, um, and I just use it as, as often as I can. Um, it's it's just a really good lens, and the the beauty of it is that I can use it on my M or I can use it on my um, my SL as well. So yeah, yeah, and and the results are incredible, especially with the SL2. Mm, it's mm, amazing. Agreed. Agreed. Have you tried mm. the um, Summicron uh, SL, the 50 millimeter Summicron SL on your SL, because that's, uh, I, I think it's actually even a step beyond that M lens, but I, I'm not sure if you've shot with it yet. I have, I have shot with it. It's mm. a beautiful mm. lens. It, is. it really is. Um, mm. And um, my favorite lens would be, which I'll, probably the next lens I'll be getting will be the 35. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah, so yeah. It's, that's just like, there's nothing like that lens. It's incredible. It, you're right, actually. And we, um, in the company, we had some internal training uh, a few weeks ago, and we were lucky to have um, Peter Carver, who's our senior lens designer. Um, mm -hmm. he's, he's the man, basically. And he, mm -hmm. he that 35 millimeter Summicron for the SL, I think he considers to be his finest, his finest lens. He was very enthusiastic about it when he was talking to us and he showed us some of the technical details and MTF charts and it's, it's off the scale. He said a 35 millimeter lens is a relatively easy one to design because it's mm. just a certain sweet spot of focal length. But nevertheless, uh, he was, yeah, he was having a bit of a rave about it, which is interesting mm. to see. So yeah, good choice. <laughs> it's a, it is a beautiful lens. It's just, I, I had a chance to use it when I was testing out the SL2 mm. and I um, had a, a loan of the um, 35 and I just, um, just went crazy with it. It's, it's <laughs> just, it's, I, I've never had a lens like that. It's just a, a magical lens. Mm. Um, mm. If anyone ever gets a chance to test one and have a play with one, it's well worth it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that's and the thing I with suppose, Leica, though. Mm. That's actually the thing with Leica, though. It's not actually the camera. So, I mean, the cameras are special, but the, 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 the most 
incredible thing about Leica are the lenses, and that's why I've used yeah. them for many years. Yeah. It's, it's just yeah. that the, nothing else looks like them. Yeah, exactly. A, a completely different, the Leica look. Exactly, and there, and there is such a thing. And that, that actually, mm-hmm. whilst, whilst we're on that subject, I'll, I'll go to an, uh, another, the second question from Gavin Green, which is how do you um, consider the SL2 versus the SL? Uh, I, I know that there's, there, one's obviously a, a progression of the other, but uh, I guess he wants to know whether he should buy an SL2 over an SL. But what do you see as the main advantages of the SL2 over the SL? Well, Nick, I had no intention of getting an SL2 because I was, I just, I was really thrilled and, and with the SL. I just loved mm. using it. And it was just, and when, when, I, when, I, when there was talk of the SL2 coming out, I thought, I just don't, there's no need for it. Mm. No need at all because it's, um, the, I mean, it was, it, was, it was such ahead of its time when it first came out, the SL. It was just, you know, it's, and it's still a beautiful camera for um, stills and even for video still. still. Mm. But the SL2, I, when I was testing it, before release and it was on the, I think it was firmware zero one or something or whatever. And it just blew me away. And it's just such a, re- a remarkable camera. And so I just, you know, I put my hand up and said, yeah, I've got to have this camera. It's just, it is that the, the, the advancement from the, the, the SL one is incredible. Um, mm. It's just amazing. And uh, in low light, um, the EVF is incredible. Uh, it's, it's just a really good camera. Mm. So, mm. Oh. Uh, no well worth well worth move, yeah. moving up to it yeah yeah no argument from me there if i think you've got some sl2 shots towards the end of your presentation so mm-hmm. let's go back to your images and i asked you yesterday i really need to know what's going on in this picture because i have no idea so tell us about what this image is all about this this is um this is actually a promotional shot for a hairdresser um, <laughs> okay. in melbourne <laughs> and um, we used to do all these different promotional shots with them for uh, on different scenarios or whatever um mm-hmm. and they did like the last supper and um some other ones and this is one they did with the uh a bohemian crazy uh and they're just just wild people good fun really good fun and it was just a shot that they sort of put out and um as a postcard actually um okay. sending that to all their clientele which was great it was it was great fun they're just you know they're good people to work with as you can see, they're just having a ball. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th- this guy here is very interesting. He's got a certain look about him, doesn't he? He's amazing. He's an amazing guy. He's um, that, that's it's his salon, and he's ah, uh, oh, it's he's, his salon. He right. really is Stavros. He's an amazing guy. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. What studio shots, um, studio flash, and everything. Or no, it was on location. Uh huh. Uh huh. It was on location. Um, it was shot, shot yeah, all shot on location. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I was fascinated by that one. Now then, this is the more the sort of the polished studio look that we uh, we expect from uh, commercial photographers, I suppose. So, what was this? Mm-hmm. Was this another? Is this a fashion or a beauty shot? Would you say it was a a shot for hair hair shot for mm-hmm. a L'Oreal L'Oreal thing, mm-hmm. um, which was done. So, um, yeah, it was it was good fun. So I think that I, I look at that now. I I actually used. I wasn't sure I was using a board for the or using the board. I think I was using. I've got an Allen Crom um, wind machine, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I think it's the only one in the country. I think at the time they had it as a high thing, and I ended up was able to get it from um, KL. And uh, mm-hmm. it's this mm-hmm. remarkable thing, this wind machine, which has got all these attachments to it, and whatever, and it just it just makes um, everything look look amazing. So that's that sort of th- really throws hair around in special yeah. ways. You've got all these different attachments for it. I don't think they made many of them because it was it must have been an expensive thing to make because it was uh, it was quite a quite a, and, and that's what uh, I used to we used to throw around the the hair to get that sort of look which was good. Yeah, I guess a, hair, a, a wind machine isn't just as simple as a fan, is it? There's there's other ways you can use it, and maybe sometimes the air is a bit more random, and other times you want it to be like a straight blast, so you've mm-hmm. got some control. This looks like yeah. it was kind of random. Was that the idea? It was. It had to look random. It wanted to look random. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. very cool. Like, I didn't that know was that. actually I didn't taken. Know there that was, was an Allen machine. <laughs> no, I don't think anyone does. I've, I think I've got, yeah. as I said, I think at the time they said, um, oh, do you want the, the guy, the rep from um, KL was telling me, so I should use mm. it for fashion, it'd be great. Mm. And I got it at a really good price. I said, oh, yeah. And he said, oh, I said, I don't think I need one. And he sort of brought it to me and we had to play with it. And I thought, I think I need this. This is great. And it's been, been a, a real um, game changer for um, wind <laughs> mm. <laughs> because mm. you, can do, you can make it really directional. Uh, it's got little little like tubes and things that come off it, and you can actually make it quite narrow a narrow piece of it, or really quite wide. It's um, mm-hmm. it's, it's a great thing, and and I, I I don't even think 
I, I really think it was just um they, i didn't think they made many of them at all mm. oh well it's, it's, it could be it's part of your look i suppose it would be a difficult mm. thing to contrive with a normal fan or anything i mean we've tried that i know when mark strawn did some uh d demonstrations in the studio in the melbourne store um we got a, mm -hmm. a fan in i think and we, we i think it was me actually lying on the floor trying to waft this fan around <laughs> trying to get the hair go like this it, it was uh, it, it was a lot of fun anyway <laughs> you can use a bunnings blower brush these days which is like one of those yeah, blower, maybe... blower things of the <laughs> garden the ones on. they, they sort of tend to do the thing <laughs> this shot as well this this shot was actually mm -hmm. taken on a cannon mm -hmm. with um um with a like a 50 mil r lens Oh yeah, adapted to the Canon that, lens. Right, yeah, adapted right. to it. The Canon camera. It was, going, it was going back a bit. That was um, one yeah, yeah. that was um, yeah, just adapted to the Canon back in the day. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose it's worth pointing out that until we had digital cameras, the camera itself was a relatively unimportant part of the whole process because it was absolutely. just a transport mechanism. Just a it was box. The film that gave you the look, wasn't it? And the glass, mm. and that was mm -hmm. the key. So the fact that you used a Canon camera. Is, is not important it's the it's the glass and the film that give you the look isn't it absolutely yeah yeah okay so let's go on to the next one here now we're into a realm of the two or three pictures here which uh, is obviously completely different to uh, the previous shot so again maybe talk us through the uh, the look here this is um infrared which i converted a camera mm -hmm. um to took a sense took the sensor glass out and put in uv filter to, um, so it's um, just shoots in infrared. So the actual images come out the camera with a pink, just a pink, pink colour, mm -hmm. and then you sort of um, manipulate it in Photoshop. If you want to sort of make it black and white, which looks really good, or mm -hmm. um, or you can have it in colour and change the colours in in the levels in Photoshop. So mm -hmm. that was pretty much all I did was darken the colours in that. So same same uh, same equipment for this one. This is infrared yep, as well. Same location, yeah. same day. Yeah. I was actually um, um, location uh, just sort sort of trying to um, source a location on the day. It was actually Anzac Day last year, and um, I was looking around and I happened to um, photographing. And I brought, brought that camera along just to have a play with it. Sort of mm -hmm. been using it a lot, and right. um, and then that, that they sort of flew flew past. So I just put the camera up there, took a, just took a snap. All right, it's it's a very unusual looking picture because of the perspective and they're almost like little crosses, um, the planes. Mm. So yeah, it really makes you look twice, which of course is a great strength of any image. Is an image that actually grabs you and makes you wonder like, hang on a sec, I need to interpret that picture. So that, that's interesting. And the same with the, the next one, it, uh, different subject, but this is this infrared or is this just heavily styled? No, it's just infrared. Okay. And then yeah. again, in the levels, just straight in the levels. So that was that was right. done. Um, I like, I really liked um, Richard Moss and his series he did in the Conga. When he, I don't know if you've seen those. He um, used the old Kodak Aerochrome um, infrared film, which mm. was made for mapping. Mm. And mm. and it gives an incredible result. You can't buy the film. I think he got some of the last last rolls of it, mm. and went out and took some shots with that. And that that sort of infrared was um, unbelievably good. But yeah. um, this this is um, this is this is something this is something I, I was actually um, last year I was um, fortunate enough to be invited to exhibit at the Florence Binali in Italy, mm. and um, so this is what I actually submitted for the um, actual exhibition. Um, there was two lots of this lot and another lot coming up later. So, and that was just again that was just shot infrared and then just mm. the just the levels in in um, in Photoshop. Mm, okay, because the think clouds come up. Thing, that's clouds. The clouds are just like that. That's just the way yeah, the clouds are. Just, yeah, with the natural. Yeah, yeah. Because one thing I think that we we are missing at the moment is that everybody is shooting with pretty much the same sensor type, which and then everything you do past that, with except for some secret source that the manufacturers put in with the signal processing, is mm. pretty much the same basic source. Whereas pre digital, and I'm not trying to say it's better or worse, it's just different. We had an astonishing variety of films which had vastly different looks, and some of them are pretty much impossible to emulate because mm. digital sensors are working on basically white light, except for your converted camera. The, the films could work with all sorts of different wavelengths, and, and, and yeah, this, the, the, the previous one, I think, and this one is a good example, and the aerial film you were talking about. There's no equivalent, mm. I don't think. Um, no, I agree, anyway. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And there's another one, I think, the similar look. This is, again, infrared, yes. I'm assuming. Yep, yep. I like this That's one. A... This is awesome. Where is, where so, is that? 
That was at um, that was in Cranbourne at the Cranbourne um, Botanic Gardens, which okay. is um, I mean those trees are like thousands of years old. They're mm. like really mm. old. Um, mm. That they've moved, they're from up north somewhere, but um, the, this um, yeah, it's an incredible place. Worth going checking it out. It's uh, wonderful there. But this this was um, actually these these prints. I was um, lucky enough to be um, when the um, uh, the award for, um, for Lorenzo del Magnifico award at the mm-hmm. um, Benali, which was good. So, which is a nice, nice little thing to have. Okay, so here's a question that I think will fit into these images because these are what I would call um, art photographs. They're not necessarily they're not commercial in the sense you're photographing a model or a building or something like that. Mm-hmm. They're possibly a personal look. So Hugh Crossway would like to know. And I quote: What have you learned on your journey about how to focus your creative energies to produce meaningful art? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> Do that one again. What have you learned on your journey about how to focus your creative energies to produce meaningful art? So I guess you could interpret that as where does some of your inspiration come from and how do you apply your creative energies to realise that vision? I, I actually um, I actually just go out and take photographs. I don't, I don't, I used to try and set up shots. I used mm-hmm. to, even, even commercially, I try and set up on days and, and do sh- do shots and I'd go to a location, check it out beforehand. Oh, this is early on, mm. and you know, get get everything ready and um, have a an idea of what or how in the photograph and whatever. And it never really works out on the day. Mm-hmm. And if you if you get locked in with some idea, mm. um, and then on the day it doesn't work, and all you're thinking about is, you know, like oh, oh no, I'm going to try and make it work and make it work. So I, I decided long ago that I just sort of um, when I do a shoot, unless it's a, a um, it's been art directed. I'll go out and shoot what I think on the day, and just mm, fair just, enough. As I, as I feel it, as I go. Yeah, so, yeah. and yeah. I, I sort of see. You know, as a photographer, you've been saying you just see it. You just see it mm. there, and just uh, there's no. I, I don't try to um, precursor. Just sort of go and um, shoot, okay. shoot, and as, as what I, what I think, what okay. I see. But doesn't that therefore require a huge amount of experience over many years and exposure to other work and, and art to so that you can say you just see it? You know, how, how, how does somebody who's at the other end of their career, do you think, uh, generate creative ideas? It's a, diff- and it's a difficult one to answer, I know. Oh, I think it's just practice. Look at books. Look at, look at books. Yeah. Go to exhibitions. Um, go to galleries. Go to mm. art galleries. I mean... Mm. You know, just you can, you can learn so much just by painting. Um, you know, the, the, um, the, there's so many galleries out there that you can go and go and look at, and it doesn't have to be photographs at all. It can be you know, sculptures or um, oil or even watercolors, anything, mm. Mm. and mm. and just get an idea and, um, and and just run with it. But and just practice, just practice. Take photographs. Take lots of yep. photographs. Yep. Yeah, I think the point about not photographs, looking at not photographs is a good idea because you can learn a lot. In fact, photographers aren't generally taught anything about art. They generally talk about cameras and hardware and numbers and exposures, but not actually the creativity uh, or the creative side. And the artists often are painters, particularly the structures of paintings, the language of painting. Mm. You can learn an awful lot from that. So I think, yeah, going to galleries is, is a great idea, but good question, Hugh. That's, that's yeah, a, really I told question. you, Robin, we'd get some gnarly questions. And that's definitely a, a gnarly one. So that's I'm going to move on yeah. to the next picture, which is, there we go. There's a vast change of subject matter there. We're, we're into architecture here. So I, when I first, met you Robin you were introduced to me as an architectural photographer but that obviously doesn't begin to describe the the breadth of your 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 work but is that still a large part of your business my business now is architecture and lifestyle I do Mm. a little bit of fashion still Um, Mm. I do some campaigns um, about Mm. three or four of those a year Um, I cut back on it I was doing a lot of fashion there for a few years there Um, and um, it sort of it took over it took took on its um, it was, every every day was just doing was doing a lot of um, like high street fashion and, and mm-hmm. um, that was that was quite quite a busy time. So I, I sort of decided to kick back and just go back to, to more what I like to do. So now I'm now I photograph lucky enough to photograph what I, what I enjoy, which mm-hmm. is architecture and lifestyle. Mm-hmm. So a lot mm-hmm. of lifestyle photography, which is um, again just going out taking pretty pictures and just, <laughs> just whatever you well, want to do on the day, just go and take some shots. And that, that's usually my brief. I get a rough brief of what to do and just go and take okay. them. Same with architecture, just take some shots. 
Yeah, because um, at least buildings don't talk it. back and, and misbehave themselves. They're static. <laughs> and I, but I love, I love it, the thing. Say. Yeah, I love the thing I love about architecture is um, like this particular one. Um, you get the photograph, brand new buildings, and this is like brand new buildings, new um, um, asphalt. Everything's just uh, brand new, and you get that mm-hmm. really um, clean sort of look to it, sort of like mm-hmm. a. Um, John Street painting sort of thing. It's sort of mm, like that sort of, mm. sort of look. Um, it's it's actually. Um, I don't know. I just I just think I like daylight. I like photographing in daylight with them, and that that's something where just just the, just picking the right time of day, uh, and and sort of go, okay. And but I also like doing evening. You know, like the golden hour as well, mm, which, yeah. is a, which is a wonderful thing. Yeah. 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 So um, there was a question, actually, I'll come, I don't know if we, don't think there's any interior shots in this collection. I'm I'm not, did we put any interiors in? I don't Um, think, I'm not sure if I did. Not sure, because there's a question from Peter Rector. What focal lengths do you use for interiors and do you use primes or zooms for that? Mm, I used to use primes only. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, because the quality, I mean, mm. that was the, because you, you just need that. But I mean, things have moved on. Mm. So now my go-to lens is my um, 16 to 35 yeah. SL. Yeah. And that's, that's just a game changer. Um, yeah. So I use that for pretty much all my, pretty much most of my architecture. So I think one of that. the- Interiors and exteriors. And exteriors, right, yeah. So no tilt shift lenses? Uh, occasionally, yes, I, I've used one. I used a 17 mil mm, TSE mm, tilt shift. Mm-hmm. Um, this was taken on on the the um, SL 16 to 35. Mm. Okay, let's go to the next one. So same same lens. No, that was um, with the T. It's with a 17 mil. I was I was uh, expecting that answer because it's a very extreme angle up, isn't mm. it? Um, you can see mm-hmm. the way the building kind of looms forward. So I wonder whether that was in mm. fact taken on the 17, um, but you've kept the verticals vertical, which I think a lot of architects kind of like. Um, so this, and again, I noticed these two shots are, are still, they're, they're not midday shots, but they're certainly not golden hour shots. Is that your choice or the client's choice? That's, that's my, no, that's my choice. I'll, I'll, mm. I'll, I'll photograph the golden hour as well. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. usually I might do during the day, if I get a good day and I'll sort of mm. wait for a good day, Mm. Um, as well as I might do a gold now. But the, the thing is, it's just to get the detail, um, like with that shot under the eaves and that sort of thing, to, so you don't get shadows, you do sort of get more bounce during the day, yes. of course. So. Oh, yes, I can see that, yeah. But it, yeah. It, it, depends on, it depends on the situation and, and, the, and the actual building, really. Yeah, yeah they're all different, aren't they? Um, just to mm. make a point there, that 17 millimetre lens Robin's referring to is not a Leica lens. It's made by another camera manufacturer. You can look that one up. But no, unfortunately, Leica don't make tilt shift lenses anymore, which is something we've been asking for for a while, but we, we mm. don't have one in our range. Um, another architecture, another a vertical shot's a little bit more unusual, I think, with uh, in architecture. And you've obviously included a lot of foreground. Was that for the balance, or was that for uh, putting copy over in some sort of brochure? No, it was because I really liked the um, the mottled light. Okay, yeah. So not a, not a com- not a commercial reason, so but was- a, a creative one. That's no, because it, I mean it was just there, and it just. Um, that grass was really wet. It was just, I don't know, it was like, mm. it was like puddles underneath. It was just sort of like mm. really wet grass. But walking, it was just sort of squishy. But um, that you know, I just wanted to get that mottled light. Mm. Um, mm. It just looks so, it just matched in with the building, which was a bit of a bonus. Yeah, really. the, the colours work beautifully, don't they? For sure. So, mm. oops, oopsie, sorry, that was my, my bad there. And then now here's a somewhat more, a sort of Jeffrey Smarty type picture. This is a very different one from to the... Yes, yeah, that's very Jeffrey Smart. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's sort of when I was when I was really take that I was I was thinking Jeffrey Smart. Um, mm. with his, his, his sort of um, feels just that the lines and everything, and mm. also I, I kind of like um, just the, just the way the um, the shadowing works on that is quite, yeah. quite good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's worth pointing out to people that these sorts of images, whilst they're not as easy to shoot as they look, because they you know, everything has to be carefully thought out, they are very accessible, and there's a lot there's lots of 
places in in the cities for instance where you can find uh situations with really interesting graphic shapes and lines of car parks uh, there's a few people i know who have a thing about underground car parks and will go and look for all sorts of different underground car parks and you can find the most amazingly graphic images just in the most banal settings and um mm. not that not this is banal of course but it, it, it's just it's it is a, a study in shape isn't it shape and light and form rather than a picture of something directly mm-hmm the, yeah. the, the car parks are great, great, great um, mm. to do a study on. I, I did, did a series years ago and you could just go on forever mm. mm. um, mm. travelling and just, you know, calling a car park. They're just, they're just so unique and different, a lot of them. It's, mm. um, it's, it's a really good project for someone to do. Mm. I, I agree, mm. definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, accessible as well. Again, I mean, that, can... that, yeah. Mm. I was just saying that um, that was taken on the um, 16 to 35 as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think it might be time for another question. Um, let me see. What, what, what these ones, um, ask that one. Oh, okay. Just um, talking of projects and styles and so on. Ella Peretet. Uh, Peretet, I think I've spelled, I've, I can't read my own writing. It's terrible. Ella. Um, mm-hmm. Two questions, really. Um, who taught you when you were first starting out? I think we've answered that because you did an apprenticeship in the studio. That's right, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah, so um, my um, the the photographer that taught me, who was my mentor as well, was Kevin Canestra. He was a, a incredible photographer, um, great eye, and technically um, brilliant. And um, he was pretty much taught me everything. He taught me to how to stand and take a photograph. Mm-hmm. Um, we tend to stand, stand and take a shot just by standing there. Yeah, and he used to always. Um, He'd stand behind me and he'd sort of knee me in the, in the leg so I'd actually bend my knees a little bit. And he said, uh, waist levels are put there for a reason. That's where you should be taking the photograph to get okay. for perspective because he's all about perspective because he's still a lot yeah. of architecture and that sort of thing. It's all about perspective even when you're doing people. So you yeah. don't shoot down on people. You can shoot yeah. straight at them and all that. Yeah. So he, was, he, was, um, he, he taught me a, a lot over the years. Okay. And um, hard taskmaster as well. Of course. Mm. I just, can you just say his name again? It didn't quite come through clearly to me. Yeah, it was Kevin Canestra. Canestra. Okay. All right. Got that one. And then the, so the, the second part of the question, which is a good one, um, your favourite project you've worked on and the hardest project you've worked on. Ooh, my favourite. Oh, I've got so mm. many. They're all my, like my little babies. <laughs> um, my favourite would be probably, which is some images coming up, later um, mm-hmm. would be I did 15 portraits 15 people because um, mm-hmm. that's pretty pretty much something recently so probably that because that comes to mind okay um, the hardest one I worked on the one that was really difficult was for Sony Japan and that was for their new computers um, a whole new range of computers and we had um, Japanese art directors a Kiwi um, oh, sorry Kiwi art director Japanese um, stylists and the mm-hmm. Japanese Sony people there and we're trying to communicate and oh. um so they didn't speak any english and i didn't really speak really good kiwi and uh <laughs> the kiwi art director was was funny as he was a great guy but it just went on for a week of um uh just photographing the computers and you know like he'd move the computer in a little spot and then the yeah. japanese guy would come over and he'd he just moved it just like a millimeter <laughs> because he had to move it just that to do that last bit and just went on for the whole week of shooting uh, but it was great. It was a great shoot. It was really good, but mm. boy, it was hard work. And then, and then they wanted all this retouching done after it because, and they kept changing the model of the computer. So changing bits of the actual computer itself. So then we had the, they'd fly out a bit of the part of the computer where they photograph it and then, um, interpret it into the actual shot. So because one, one minute was mesh, the next minute wasn't going to be mesh. So <laughs> we're talking about um, a whole range. So the laptops and, um, the whole 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 gamut so it was actually that was a really difficult shoot uh, it went on forever so. <laughs> felt like it <laughs> was a good, good question too mm. thanks for that one there, ella that's great there's another mm. a very different perspective again tell us so what this was shot for and how you shot it okay that was that was up in um that was shot up at the gold coast that was a lifestyle that was for a lifestyle it was a lifestyle shoot for um, some high, uh, apartments and 
motels that um, very high end, and um, that was actually shot from a high rise. Mm. That was set up and shot from a high rise building, shot down onto them, which is quite quite a crazy shot, really. Mm. So that that was just going around taking pretty pictures around um, the Gold Coast, and um, that, that was pretty much it. So it was great, great gig to get. Okay. Um, question from Ralph Domino. Could you talk about copyright and the, what the approach should be when shooting street photography in public places with images of people which are going to be used for advertising? And this image probably fits into that category. Uh, do you need to get model releases for all of these people? Uh, and could you, for instance, enter these pictures in competitions later on? So where, where does this sort of image sit with, that, with those sorts of regulations? With, um, with any, anything I do for advertising is always um, model releases. Mm -hmm. It's always signed. If it's for street photography and for private use or for exhibitions or anything like that, you don't need. Mm -hmm. um, luckily enough in Australia to have copyright um, yeah. um, or, or signed model releases. So, but any, anything for um, advertising, um, you, you really do need. And also mm -hmm. if you're um, in, in private um, places, you sort of need to have permission as well. Okay. So, and best to sign, get, best to get it signed. Yeah. But um, what about this shot? How, you couldn't possibly get model releases for all these people, could you? Um, that wasn't end up being, that didn't end up being used, but um, that, oh, um, that's why I use it for myself because I don't, I don't actually ah. use a lot of shots. Right. But um, that wasn't used, but it was um, something I, I, I took a lot of the shots and um, that was one I just really loved. And I was mm. quite disappointed in not getting used. Actually. Okay. Yes, it's, a, it's a definitely a good shot. Um, mm. Next one. Now we're moving into some of the, um, these are America, aren't they? Um, this mm -hmm. is heading into a very different, very high key bleached look. Where, where, where did the inspiration for these next few pictures come from? Ah, uh, look, that, America's got a certain light about it. So it doesn't take much before you get that sort of, depending on, on times of day and times of year, you get that sort of light in your way. And um, these, these were just um, personal shots I did for myself mm. and taken on my M9P. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was a 24 mil. And it just, that, that, the, the M, M9 gave it, it, it was a, the, the, whatever um, sensor was in that, it gave a really beautiful look mm. that I don't think I've seen in any other sort of camera. Um, it's it, it's just that really kind of film look, and I, I didn't have to do much to that to um to get it looking like that, mm. and and, mm. and also that the lighting time again that, that sort of blue light that they it's, you sort of have yeah. in in America the California sort of thing yeah the um the M nine was the last of the CCD sensors that Leica used because when they went to the two forty it changed to a CMOS sensor and I've mm. heard from real um affectionados of the, uh, the the brand that the M9 was the last of the good digital sensors. <laughs> now, I don't agree with that because there are some things that the later cameras will do, particularly at high ISO. But you're right, there is a very distinct look to that. And I think people, um, that the value of M9s has held up very well because people are scouring eBay and secondhand markets to find M9 mm. cameras specifically for that CCD look. And I think you've, you've you know, hit the nail on the head with that one. But I, I couldn't tell by looking at it on, on the screen that it was shot on the CCD. So it is a subtle difference. Um, have you actually compared them directly or is it just something that you, there's a feel of it that you, you recognise? No, I went, I had the M9 and, and I just love the film-like look to it that mm -hmm. it had. And I noticed the difference when I um, moved up to the 240. Mm. Um, was it 240? Was it M2, next yeah, 240, 240 was 240? next, yeah, yeah the type 240. Yeah. And then I, I but I, I actually got to use video a bit on that, so it was um, well worth having, sort of worked mm. out. I, wasn't, I didn't see a need for video, but I ended up having to, ended up using video on it for mm. a couple of times, which is mm. unfortunate not to have it there. But then, then I moved to the M10 and I'm not getting rid of that camera anytime soon. So I'm just going to, there's a few pictures of the same style here, just to, Go through a few mm -hmm. of these. So th this is a. We were talking before mm -hmm. about projects. So this is a. This is something that you've done for yourself. And I think it's worth pointing out mm -hmm. to, to people who are listening that it's actually a really good way to become more creative is to narrow your view of things into one particular topic. Uh, would Would you agree with that, yes. um, Robin? Yeah, I, I, I sort of go for projects. So if, so this was a project I just happened to decide to do when I was over there. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so you just, just just give yourself a, a project and just just run with it, or or even have three or four going at once, mm-hmm. um, yeah. different types, and just you know move move back to them. It's something you can do over a twelve month period, six month period, or even longer. You know, two years or whatever. Just mm. like like I was saying with the car parks earlier. Um, mm. It's, it's, it's something can be ongoing and and if you have three or four projects i mean just take pictures just take you know just, just the more I, I, I often I often go out in the weekend and just um just take the camera mm. and um take photographs it's just something okay. I, I love to do um, which the beauty with the the thing with the thing with the m camera though the m camera is something where it makes you want to be a better photographer mm. because with me I, I lose more photographs than i get but when you get a good one yeah. it's it's just so yeah. special that it's worth yeah. persevering. Yes. It really is. Agreed. So. Agreed. And this range of pictures leads me to a question that came up before from Vincent Ip. Do you document your life, personal lifestyle? I use a Leica Sofort to document my life, my time in the studio and my time on the street, just a documentary to add to my work, sort of behind the scenes pictures, I suppose. Do you ever do that? Uh, did on an advertising campaign. Some of the guys, the assistants, did it. Wanted to do it. So they actually do um, behind the scenes video thing. But other than that, no, haven't done. No. That's something I'm really. Yeah, it's like a diary, I suppose. Just, just, just getting usually, out. when you're working, it's just the last. Sorry. Uh, I say, I think Vincent's thinking of it in terms of is that like a, like a personal diary of the things that you are doing rather than the images that you shoot, but a, a diary as you go. Do you have you ever done that? No, I don't. I, I used to. I used to do a, do a diary years ago, and and I think it's a good thing to do and write down what the lighting was, or um, and the and and what what lens, what what um, um, film I used, or or what um, focal length. But I, I don't do that anymore. So okay. It's not to do. All right. I'll just move on to the next one of these pictures. Is another. This is the one we used as the the hook picture or the lead picture for our you know promotions for this talk, and um, I. I have the luxury of getting to pick them most of the time. Sometimes I get overruled. And I, I, I picked this picture, and I, I'm still not entirely sure why I did. But I, I do like that sort of very much a 60s look to the whole thing, um, very much that sort of the American dream going on there, the late 50s, early 60s sort of pops into my mind. But I'm not quite sure what the car is. Do you, do you know what the, the car is, the, the, uh, the model? Yes, it's, it's a, a Studebaker. Yeah. Of course it is. <laughs> now I, I do I do enjoy this one, and we I just was talking to one of our other Leica Academy instructors uh, yesterday doing an interview, Bill Green, and uh, he spent some time in Los Angeles. This is exactly the sort of stuff mm-hmm. he'd be really enjoying because uh, he, he would get the the whole genre in this one, and even the architecture here is 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 classic sort of seventies California. I'm 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 guessing at the dates, but that's mm. my feel. Yes, right. same. Yeah, yeah, mm, fair enough. Definitely. So question, um, two questions we'll do here. Um, from Andrew Sharp, hi Andrew. Um, Robin, with such a wide ranging style type, do you have a specific style where you feel like you have more creative freedom and does that make you lean towards taking more work of that type? Um, that's exactly what I'm doing at the moment. So I take more the work I want to do now. Right. So I'm, now, I'm, I'm pretty much more doing lifestyle photography. Mm. Mm-hmm. where I just take pretty pictures for clients and I get a brief um, from an art director and just go out and take take lots of pretty pictures. So that's right. something where, you know, it might be um, in on locations, might be uh, around the city um, in cafes or restaurants or some food mm-hmm. shots or um, some beach shots or just, just might be some pretty sites of Melbourne which right. they use for their advertising promotional work. Okay. Yeah. Which uh, also answers Rosalie Nielsen's question, which was, Robin, do you still have time to shoot your own personal work? Yes. And if so, what, is, what sort of landscape is your preferred subject and what camera do you use for your art photographs? For my art photographs is my M10. M10. And usually either my, my 35mm um, F1.4 or my 50mm um, Aposomicron. Okay. So they're, they're right. sort of pretty much the lenses I use mostly for that now, yeah. Okay. So they yeah, so it's a specific I mean, answer. It's pretty good. Well, my, my M10 is um, it just, you know, it's like when you use it, Nick, it's just sort of, you, sort of, you feel yeah. creative even if you're not. That's what I've got on my <laughs> sort of, desk right here. Yeah. It just makes you feel like you're sort of a, 
most and the other thing with it is you can go out and take photographs with that camera mm. if you're doing street photography it's mm. it's just it, there's just nothing as, as good for the simple reason that people who would just be looking at the camera so they're not taking notice of you because they're watching the camera yeah. or they're thinking oh that's a funny looking camera yeah. or if they know yeah. what it is um then they want to talk to you about the camera so yes. i get stopped quite a lot so um so it's just it's just such an easy it's, it's just it makes it so easy and if i don't want if i wanted to be um i used to have like with the the m9 i had the p mm. um with this m10 i've just got the the red dot one so i've got yep, the yep. but i actually get some i get some electrical tape yeah um you know the silver tape and i'll put that over the little red dot if i don't just want to keep oh, a little okay. bit more is this um, incognito m10, kind of thing m10p same same thing it's an m10p but the um well here's a question for you just for me if i may the the q2 and the m10 are incredibly similar in their dna but do you still think mm. the m10's got the edge over the q2 in terms of what you've just been talking about is on the street or because I know Jesse Marlowe shoots the Q2 a lot. Um, in fact, almost exclusively and you're shooting the M10. The differences between them are subtle. Um, I mean, obviously autofocus is a big difference, but I'm thinking more in terms of mm. the look when you're actually out on the street and the reaction you get from people. Um, I've never, I've, I mean, Jesse would be probably the better one to uh, um, answer that question because I, I've never used it at the Q. I've never used it. Okay. So I don't know, no, don't know how it works. Okay, so I've enough. always wanted to have a play with it, but never really got, got round to it. We'll so have to arrange it for you, Robin. And Definitely. the monochrome one, I want the monochrome one. I want to organise too. I just have it. Just going to play with that one as well, which I think is a remarkable camera. That'd yeah. be that's just luxury. It's so it, good. It's but, pretty cool. The the big problem we've got, Robin, is that, that people keep buying them, so they they're very hard to actually get hold of to uh, mm -hmm. to demonstrate to people because they as soon as we get stock, they go out to the door. So which is a good thing. Which is a good thing for us. You're funny okay. about that, though, isn't it? <laughs> now then, another change of pace, uh, more fashion. Um, tell us about this image, Robin. That was a menswear campaign. Um, went about an hour out of Melbourne for this one. That was a great, great day, um, great model. Um, and um, that was that was on the um, S007, the Leica S, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with the 70 mil. Um, okay. CS lens, uh, which is beautiful camera. It's, that's another beautiful oh, yeah. camera. But that, it's more the lenses with that as well. It's the yeah. lenses that are the thing. Yeah, it's just incredible. Yeah. But that, uh, yeah, that was a that was a really fun day. That was windy as hell up there on that because that it was a house in the background, and then um, that was actually on on a sort of a hill, and mm. it was really cold. Um, it was in winter, and it was um, last year actually, and uh, very very windy. Yeah. Now, is that picture time. lit or is that available light? That was, you know, I, I think I think I might have had a pro photo with that. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I I just I, I can't remember if we did or, did or not on that actually. So it was, it was like no, the, six or eight months ago or something. The reason I ask is because it has a slight polished look to it with the light, mm. which is very hard to do with available unless you're very very lucky. But when you do it well, like in this example, it's really hard to tell. So using the external light. Um, out on location in full sunlight. Are this, is, is that something you, you do a reasonable amount of time or do you prefer to work with available light? Um, with the... I do love using, I do love using flash when I was using, when I used the, um, the S because with the mm. CS lenses, mm. because you can crank the shutter speed right up mm. Mm. and get that really nice look and get that really dark blue sky. Yeah, um, yeah, sort of like that yeah. evening look in the middle of the day, and that's a, that's a, such a good thing. Which I, I think the, I think the S is the only one doing with this. Those yeah, sort of exactly. Uh, just uh, on school. a point, on a technical point there to explain uh, what uh, Robin's talking about. The S system has two ranges of lenses. The CS lenses have what's called a uh, leaf shutter inside the lens, and this allows them to be used with flash at a much much higher shutter speed than you would normally be able to do. And that's not the same thing as high-speed sync on uh, other cameras, including no. the SL. Uh, it's actually a genuine full-power flash at a two... I think they go to a two-thousandth of a second, if I'm not mistaken, certainly a one-thousandth. And that allows you to use a wider aperture in full sunlight. Uh, and that is a very, very distinctive look. And only those lenses uh, will do it. And Plus, of course, the old-fashioned film lenses. We used to take it for granted with Hasselblads and Mimirs and all the old film exactly. cameras. Now it's very hard to do. So, yeah. Mm. Okay. 
But with that camera, you can actually get that really, you know, middle of day, that really dark blue sky, and it's sort of, it's just, a, it's a certain look, as you said. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I moved the pictures too quickly there. So mm, moving on okay. to it, another architectural but historical one. Now I believe this is Italy, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that was when I was at the Binali last year, sort of early morning um, at the Duomo, and um, just anywhere Italy's uh, worth <laughs> taking taking a camera with. So you just, you know, you could just go through miles of, um, of shots over there. It's, the that's, that's a, it's, Italy in the morning is beautiful. Mm. Just the, light, the lighting, especially around Florence, is just yeah. Yeah. Uh, amazing light. Yeah. I, I can't quite make out what's in the foreground here. The screen I'm looking at is a little angled. Um, it, it, you've obviously used those shapes to not only match the, 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 the building in the distance, but also to use the diagonal lines. But what's actually in those little boxes? I can't quite see. It's, it's early morning, so um, it was actually traders were just getting, getting the, ready for whatever they do for their day, and that's oh, okay. all firewood. Oh, firewood. Okay, now it makes, yeah, mm. I can see it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, this is the architectural photographer and you coming out because it's all very rigidly uh, composed, which I, I actually really appreciate rather than uh, one thing that um, I'm sure you will have said this to people many times is to be very, make sure that you, you do it properly. It is, sloppy pictures tend to be just a little bit geometrically wonky. Uh, uh, make it strongly wonky if you're going to do that or make it strongly correct i think is uh, it will always be a, a better result so yeah i was, I was always taught because like, like my mentor going back to um mm. i was talking about kevin canestra that um you had that vertical you had that had, and it was always shot in camera like most of most of my shots probably the majority of my shots are cropped in camera very if i if i have to crop it later i, I feel like i've um i've lost mm. so mm. it's got to be done in camera so I, I i hate to actually crop a picture and okay. very seldom do so it's something yeah. i just don't like to do and right. I think that goes back to film days. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but I also like the verticals to be straight. And even yeah. in the old days with um, printing, I'd sort of you know get the easel and get my lights easel back in the day, and um, and, and and adjust it to mm. um, make sure the perspectives are right. Um, yes. If it was student, we did a lot of architecture back then in four or five, with four or five mm. sheet film and um, mm. view cameras. But um, or, or you know, just correct a little bit in the dark room as well if needed. Mm. Yeah. But mostly yes. done in camera. Okay. Much as possible, really. As yeah. much as possible. The, um, yeah. With the dark room technique Robin's talking about, you can actually angle the, the board that the paper goes on and correct verticals. It's the kind of the opposite of changing the lens. It's a, it's a lesser known technique that you can do in the dark room. And uh, it's not actually that easy to do, is it? No. <laughs> no. It took All me a while right. to get, get a little longer. Now, these last two pictures of the set, I believe, are shot on the SL2. Is that right? Yes, that was, this is when I was testing the camera and mm -hmm. um, I actually decided to do a, um, a shoot of, um, I got um, 15, 15 people yeah. and decided to just do on the background, which you can't see there and some of the shots you can see, it, it's an old mm -hmm. truck um, canvas. You know those trucks, the big trucks have those old, those have the canvas on the sides of the, and, and this, is, this is a really old one, it's oh, yeah, very yeah. old, it's massive, massive mm -hmm. backdrop. Mm -hmm. And it's been um, stitched and patched and whatever, and it's quite, mm -hmm. quite still even dirty, whatever. But we sort of clean up as much as we can. And I, I thought I'd get old background, and then the, this, this um, specifications for the shoot were that um, the, for the girl models, they had to have no makeup, just come come raw, mm -hmm. and it was just available just a studio light, which I've got here now, which is the same as what we've got here now, and then um, and then and just with the SL two, and I use a seventy five mil. Um, Apo, which was um, beautiful. So the whole lot was shot the same. So first shot of each with the with the women was um, just no makeup, and that's that's quite confronting, really. Mm. Um, when you sort of ask that sort of thing, I, I didn't think I'd get many takers for it, which I did, which I was, I was fortunate enough to get that. And then after that, they could um, go into the makeup room and put on makeup and do whatever they wanted. So it was their posing; they had to do everything themselves. It's all raw, so they had to pose the way they wanted to. I didn't 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 want to try and get them to pose oh. any in any way. And um, just to, just it was their portrait. Whatever they want to do, they could do. Uh, and this is Josh. He's a great guy. He's just um, he's amazing. You know, I've used him in some um, uh, menswear fashion shoots, and uh, he's he just comes up so well. He's very giving. One thing I notice in this picture is that you are not you're not over lighting it. Um, there's there's hidden things here. Um, it's it's a relatively low key image. Um, 
I, I know there's a, a tendency to try and light everything so you've got detail everywhere. But in this case, it seems like you've gone a slightly different path. I presume that's completely deliberate. It's just a couple of um, um, panels, um, panel boards, and um, mm -hmm. just available light. That's so it. That's, that's it's pretty much it. No retouching, just as is. Yeah, because uh, there's a question here from Valerie Jenkins, uh, which is how much post-processing do you do on your photos? Um, depending, on, depending on what it is. I don't, I don't do a lot. I don't like sort of spending a lot of time on, on, in, on, um, in Photoshop. So I, I, this was pretty much just a level. So that was it. Mm -hmm. And the light is just a bounce from the, from the actual um, natural light in the studio because I've got, I've got a lot of... Um, Skylight, so it's all lit by skylight and mm. windows. We can see the studio um, which behind can, you. Is, it, is that shot in your studio that's behind you right now? That's that's the studio behind me. Yeah. Mm, mm, so that mm. was shot. That was shot here. Mm -hmm. um, and with all the portraits too, it was different times of day. So I didn't want to have them all at any set times of day. So some were quite dark because it was shot um, um, six at night or something. Um, mm. Others were shot. Um, so it's quite so dark, darkens off in the afternoon because the sun sort of. Uh, gets blocked out from yeah. um, other buildings. This uh, but that's pretty last... much um, as it is. That's that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This 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 is the last shot, I believe. And this is the same series, I think. Mm hmm. Yeah, because that would be a hard one to pull off, I think, because of the the brightness range between the skin tones, the background, and the the fingernails. But it, it's a very striking image. It, it does require close scrutiny. This one, I think. Well, it's it's that that's the thing. This. This was a, um, a couple of these, these shots were the ones when I took these, I decided that I, I can't do without an SL2. So it was actually these <laughs> shots that made me decide I really needed one because of just, yeah. just what it was giving me mm. um, with very little effort is mm. um, uh, what, what um, I like the camera for. It's just, mm. and with that 75mm lens with it, it just works so damn well. well so, I mean, um, all the lenses on the SL are, you know, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah that, well, that's I mean, that's, that, that's just that's just out. That's just pretty much out the camera. Yeah. All I did was um, just just brought the levels up a little bit, exposure, and that was it. Yeah. So it's not okay. not retouched or anything. Um, yeah. Pretty much just raw. Yeah. They were just. And that was still when that was still when the SL was still. I think it was still the, the firmware wasn't even the, the the right firmware. It was still at the um, zero one or whatever. What was it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Something mm -hmm. around there or something. So. Uh, yeah, and, no, no. and I was just like blown away with it. Yeah, and you, you mentioned the want versus the need. <laughs> you said it's a camera I wanted, but then you just, you justified needing it. I seem to remember going through the same thought process myself when I got my SL two. So uh, I'm I'm with you on that one. Um, the seventy five. But as I said, when I first. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go mm -hmm. on. The, uh, the say, seventy-five millimeter lens is. Um, so we've got a bit of lag going on here. My my, my apologies. It's uh, bouncing back at me. I was just going to ask you about the seventy-five mil and how you found that for portraits because I think it's absolutely astonishing, and um, clearly you must do too because you've used it. But uh, it, it's it's quite a distinct look that lens. I think it really is. It's it's got a, it's got a look of its own. It's just a. I was, I was contemplating whether to get the ninety or the seventy-five, but the seventy-five just for me. Uh, for portraiture, it's just a really nice. It's a, it's just a beautiful lens. Mm, it just works mm. so well. It's and the, the the sharpness of it and the fall off, mm. um, fully open is um, is beautiful. Have yeah, you really, made really like any um, big prints off that lens or that off the camera and lens combination? I haven't. I've got I've got um, I've got a whole um, box of um, large um, paper to print cans and yeah. paper, but. I think I'll get round to it in the next few weeks. Get round so, to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's the last one of the photographs that we've got um, to to show you. So I'm just going to stop that share. So you should now be seeing a side by side. There's a couple of questions that we haven't had a chance to get to yet. Uh, I'll just just a couple. We've been through most of them. I'm just going to skim back through and just see. Which ones? Oh, here's one from Roseanne Muir. What, uh, I think I pronounced that right. Um, when you say, you, you, Robin, you made a comment before about pretty pictures. Um, do you mean that you like to capture a moment in time? Do you see yourself as a documentary photographer? I think you mentioned that in terms of when you were in America and you were just taking, uh, I'm not sure whether you mentioned just taking pretty pictures, but do you see yourself as a documentary photographer as well? I, 
I'd like to see myself as a documentary photographer. I don't, I don't think I'd do a lot. I'd, I'd, I'd like to do a lot more of my own personal work to do doc, to document um, scenes and images. But um, yeah, I, 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 that's something I'm, I'm doing a lot more of now. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Lucky enough to be able to do so. It's, it's something I'm, I'm actually heading more into. I mean, I've done documentary work over the years, mm. uh, and, um, and and it's something where I've I really enjoy doing. And, and that comes back to where, when I was um, with Carol Jeremy, who was a documentary photographer, and um, she just documented that time and, and, and that place, and um, which is, was quite prominent for and um, um, well, lot well loved for for what what she did at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it's something I, I've, I've always wanted. That's what I started off wanting to do in photography, mm -hmm. and then um, I thought, well, I need to make a living out of it. So yeah. that's when I was fortunate enough to get a job as a commercial in a commercial studio, and, and was lucky to make a living out of it. So yeah, yeah, okay. Um, question from Timothy Moon um, regarding the infrared. Do you know which particular um, uh, wavelength of, of infrared the camera is capturing? Is, I think because I think you can have different choices. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I got it. I, it's, it's on an old camera. It's on an old Canon camera mm. um, and 5D. And I remember looking it up and thought that'd be really cool because um, let's get that sort of cool look, which I, because I used to do, I mean, which you probably did too. I used to use a lot of infrared back in the day on film, black nope. and white. Never done it. Never, ever. Never, it was just really never done difficult. My... Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it was a real why. challenge because you had to sort of re pre focus and work out your focus. Well, it was really quite a quite a thing to do. And so mm -hmm. when I when I read somewhere that you could do infrared, so all I know is I took I took the um, I ordered a, a, a filter thing for it mm -hmm. and um, to give me the full. So what I'm getting at is just the pink because there's different types you can get, but you just get that pink image. Mm -hmm. So you can sort of Google that and find out which one of these because there's different different variants of, of um, infrared. And then I just um, sent it around the corner to the camera exchange. Mm. Uh, sorry, camera, camera. What's it called? The camera clinic. Camera clinic, in, yeah. In Collingwood, around the corner, and um, they just they just fit it all up for me. So okay. it was that simple. So they no, took out okay. whatever and put that one in that I ordered from somewhere. I don't remember where I ordered from. But you, know, you can still do it. You just Google and order the the filter or something, um, and then take it from there. Okay. But I, I've got no idea about what the what the actual. Okay. Another last, let's call this one the last question because we've, uh, we've at the end of our allotted time. Um, mm -hmm. This is a sort of a, 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 a closing question, I suppose, because um, that Simon Vinson would like to know, hi, Robin, could you please explain what storage system you use for your photographs? Do you use a separate server or perhaps millennial disks or some other system? So really it's a case of obviously you shoot a lot of stuff. What, where, where how do you keep them safe? Um, Without naming brands, I suppose I was I was stuck. I was really into using a certain brand that's um, sort of pushed for photographers in black boxes, mm -hmm. and um, I used those for years. And they seem to have a life of three years. Oh. And I was I was talking to you when we were sort of caught up a little while ago, and we we're talking mm -hmm. about what you were doing with your 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 um, images and how you were storing them. Mm -hmm. And I thought it's about time I got serious about it. So I actually got a NAS system. Okay. And during this last couple of months, I've been actually transferring everything over. So I've still got the other other boxes. Mm. Um, so I use a um, at the moment I'm using Drobo boxes, but I've, I've got I'm, I'm now um, going across to um, a NAS system, mm. 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 and which I'm finding's working really well. So hopefully mm. that will be the thing. And yeah. then I mean I've got about I mean you can just keep adding hard drives to it. So I think I've got yeah. twelve or twelve. Um, terabytes in each and I've got five of wow. those so and I just keep yeah. adding to that as I go so I've got, I, I keep backups that um, which are my own personal work and mm -hmm. and with clients work I keep for two to three years mm -hmm. and then I don't and then I'm not so fussed about it so I, I do three backups mm, so good and one one's kept in a, in a massive old safe that I got years ago. Excellent. I'm very, very happy to hear that because one of my, those people who know me will know it's one of my little bugbears is people who do all this elaborate um, copies and everything, but they actually keep the whole lot in their office and then mm. there's no offsite storage and it's, it's actually crucial to the whole process to, to actually yeah, do that. So yeah, that, that's and the, the other thing now takeaway. with clients work, with clients work, with current clients work, I also put it on the cloud as well. Just ah. have a separate backup. Okay. So okay, I do that that's as well. interesting. Yeah. 
And what's your experience mm. of that been like using the cluster? Because I found it impractically slow, but that's because I have a really bad internet connection. So presumably you've got a better one where you are. No, it was dreadful. I just did, I, I tried different ways and ended up using Dropbox because it's um, mm-hmm. it doesn't drop. I used to use some other other ones, some of those um, uh, like we transfers and whatever. So it take forever. So I think um, up I was getting between one point five and one point eight, and down I was getting a hundred, which was really mm-hmm. good. But the up is what I wanted, mm-hmm. and so I just yeah. leave it overnight. And it used to yeah. up, next morning come out and it still hadn't it just died or whatever and just dropped. So, <laughs> but with the um, Dropbox, it just just continually. Is, works but over the last month i've actually gone across to nbn and getting about uh, 35 up which is luxury uh, luxury my goodness so in luxury. the old days and back 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 before then it was just you know i'd get clients work and i just put it up on the cloud and it'd, and it'd take a day or two to get it up there but um okay. now it's just taking minutes so it's um, uh, luxury it's an absolute luxury yeah i'm still waiting for mine my, my high speed stuff where we're, i'm even worse off 0.8 but i play. did <laughs> but I did have my MBM was down for two days the other day, so oh, no. um, which was very annoying. So it's the first time it has been, but that was that was that wasn't very good at all. So I had two days down, but now it's working again. So here we are. Okay, here we are indeed. So on that note, Robin, thank you very much for spending the uh, this hour this afternoon with us and answering these questions in a very candid manner and showing us your um, astonishingly wide range of images. So I hope everybody realised from this that you can be many things in photography. You don't. It's great mm. to specialise, but it's also great to generalise, um, although Robin's good at all of them, so <laughs> that's, that's pretty awesome. But so thank you, Robin. So before we go, just a couple of things about what's coming up next. Um, we, this is the eighth of our webinars. We've done eight weeks, and we're shifting the time slot. Um, last time we had a bit of a, uh, a poll on what times people preferred, and we're shifting to the, 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 the overwhelmingly more popular time of midweek in the evening. Uh, rather than weekends and uh, two o'clock on a Friday. So for a while, at least, we'll be moving to a 7 p.m. time slot on a Wednesday. Uh, The uh, newsletter, which will go out presumably today or tomorrow morning, will have the new uh, times and the new topics. Um, But uh, for the the moment, and we're skipping next week, I should mention, because we've got to, uh, rather than bring it forward by three days, I've pushed it back a few days. So the next one will be June 10, which is a Wednesday. And I'm going to do uh, a series of Lightroom tips and tricks. It's not a how to use Lightroom uh, seminar. It's really a case of going through some very detailed little um, little, little quirky things about Lightroom that you may or may not know and how, how that those can help you in your workflow. So you can tune into that one, uh, 10th of June, 7 p.m. And then after that one, we're going to do, do some webinar, some uh, online workshops, not a webinar, but an online workshop for a limited number of people. And I'm going to start off with the basics of photography. So people who are new to photography, maybe just bought a camera um, or something, and they have questions uh, about the really basic stuff, where to start and so on, then we're going to be covering that. But as always, um, sign up for our newsletter, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and you'll see this video and others recorded, and you'll also be kept up to date with what's coming up in the future. So I'll put that link up in a sec. I forgot to do that last week. Sorry about that, and I won't forget this time. But um, but just thank you to Robin for his generosity. Um, and Robin, I'll see you next time in Melbourne. Thank you, Nick. Take right. care. Bye for All now. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye bye.